Hey everyone, my name is Adam. I am a top MCAT scorer and MCAT tutor here at Shamasian Consulting. And today we're going to be walking through a biology passage and I'm going to be showing you guys some high yield strategies as well as tips and tricks to be able to do well on passages like these on your MCAT. Um, so let's jump right into it. Um, and before we get into it, I just wanted to briefly mention um, that where this kind of falls within the MCAT, for some of you may have had more practice than others and are familiar with the MCAT structure, but basically the MCAT is four major sections. Um, your first section is your chemistry and physics section, then you have your critical analysis and reading section, um, then you have a, a lunch break for 30 minutes, and then becomes this section. It's the biology and biochemistry um, section and that's where you would find a passage similar to one that we have here um, and then our final session is um, psychology and sociology it's kind of our humanities section um, and and then you're done it's only those four sections um, they're all 95 minutes except for cars which is 90 minutes um, so in total it's six hours and 15 minutes so in a lot of ways the MCAT is an endurance exam and a stamina exam as much as it is anything else um, but with that being said, this type of passage, a biology passage, is you'd find this in that third section of the exam for the biology and biochemistry um, exam. So as I jump into this and I kind of analyze how I would look at this, um, first thing you kind of want to know for any passage that's science-based, so the chemistry, physics, or biology, biochemistry passage, is you want to be taking about eight minutes. Um, and the reasoning on how we get to that, about eight minutes, is because you'll have um, 15 discrete questions, and then you're going to have 10 passages on the biology biochemistry section. So those first 15 discrete questions, um, however you choose to do them, whatever your strategy is for that, um, should take you about 15 minutes. So then you have 80 minutes left of your 95 minute section, and you have 10 passages. So that's about eight minutes a passage. Um, for our practice today, we're going to probably take a little bit longer than eight minutes, just because we're going to really talk everything out about um, the reasoning as to what we are thinking. Obviously, we can think faster than we talk. So this will probably take a little longer than eight minutes, but um, let's jump into it now. So as we approach a passage like this, let's start over at the passage section. I'm going to zoom in um, and we'll start at the beginning here. So it says, Occutaneous al albinism, OCA, is a genetically heterogeneous group of disorders characterized by absent or reduced pigmentation of the skin, hair, and eyes from the time of birth. So first thing I'm noticing here, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to highlight, is um, this occutaneous albinism. That seems like kind of the main player. Um, so I'm going to say that's probably going to be important going forward here. OCA type 2, OCA2, is the most common form of the disease, but no effective treatments currently exist for the disease. Researchers interested in studying OCA2 decided to develop a mouse model of the disease as a model through which potential therapeutics could be evaluated. Okay, so we have a disease that impacts the skin, hair, and eyes, and OCA type 2 is the most common form, and there's no treatments, so they're going to try and create treatments um, using mice, using a mouse model. Um, to try to develop potential therapeutics. So why did I highlight what I highlighted here? I highlighted the main player, which is OCA, um, targeting the ha skin, hair, and eyes. OCA2 is the most common type. There's no treatments. So this study is going to use mouse models to come up with some potential therapeutics. Okay, so this is not probably going to be super helpful paragraph for answering any questions, but I highlighted what I did here um, just so that we can kind of see what we're about to read. And if we forgot everything we read here in this first paragraph, we can go back and just read our highlights and much more quickly, without having to read the whole paragraph again, get a feel for kind of what this setup is. Okay, and then as we go in here, to identify the causative gene in the Z0015 mouse cell line, researchers performed a family-based genome-wide linkage study, GWLS to map the chromosome regions co-segregating with the mutant phenotypes. Okay, so this is pretty wordy. There's a lot going on here, but 
we're kind of going to look for what type of topics or what type of things in here would be related to something that would be like fair game for the MCAT. Like they're not expecting um, people who just are coming out of undergrad to have PhD level knowledge of biology or biochemistry or any of this level of stuff, but they are going to require the types of things that that you have learned about in your undergraduate courses, all of your prerequisite courses. Um, and so anything that you've learned in those um, is fair game. You can go on the AAMC website to get a more um, exhaustive list. You can also go on our website, um, Shemiasen Consulting, um, and we have a lot of MCAT tools on there that are all free for you guys to access. So something that's interesting here um, is we know a little bit about chromosomes. We know a little about mutant phenotypes. So I would probably highlight them and I would highlight what kind of the um, the type of study that we have. It's a genome wide linkage study. So I would highlight that just even if you don't know what that is, the fact that they tell us what that is could be important. Um, and we're also trying to identify the causative gene. So the purpose of the study. So identify a causative gene in GWLS um, for mutant phenotypes. Okay, then as we go on, the results showed a single missense mutation, C2228, C to T, that resulted in a serine transition to leucine, OCA2, hereafter referred to as S743L in exon 21. Okay, so what about that sentence would be relevant to someone who's taking the MCAT? So what do we know about that? We know what a missense mutation is. So I would highlight that because we know what that is. And we know our, um, our amino acids. So we would highlight those. So the results are a single missense mutation that resulted in serine transition to leucine. So I would highlight those. And maybe in exon 21, we don't know if that's relevant yet. We, we might not care about where that is because I don't know much about um, like if location would matter that much for, you know, for our level of knowledge for the MCAT. So I would not necessarily care, but I'm going to highlight it just in case they do ask any questions about location. Further data revealed that the mutation was likely the causative mutation. That's great. OK, I would highlight that. That might be important because that's what they're trying to find. Right. We're trying to identify the causative gene. So if this mutation is the causative mutation, that could be really helpful. So this mutation is orthologous to the human mutation. OK, that's helpful. We we're not going to highlight anything there, but that kind of proves that what they've done here has some kind of purpose because it's ortho orthologous to the human mutation. So it, it would translate the studies that they've done and the mice will translate over to humans. That's why that's helpful there. Then if we go down, read a little bit more. The S743 mutation is located in the predicted transmembrane domain 10 of the porcine OCA2 protein and is evolutionary conserved among distinct mammals, indicating its vital role with this domain for the function of OCA2. Okay, that's looking pretty wordy, but what can we pick out that we are aware of or that we know a little bit about? Um, I would probably pick out here that it's like, it's, it's located in the transmembrane domain 10. We maybe don't necessarily care, but we do know what a transmembrane means. So we know a little bit about that stuff. So I would highlight that um, of a certain protein and is evolutionary conserved and in indicating its vital role. Um, so I would maybe, I would maybe consider that to be important. The fact that the mutation is transmembrane and evolutionary conserved. That's kind of things that we would have to know about. Um, indicating it's a vital role within this domain for the function. Okay, the S743L mutation did not alter OCA2 expression at the transcript level. Okay, so mutation did not alter transcript level. Just highlight that because that might matter. Researchers then hypothesized that protein expression might be affected and they measured protein expression in the eyes and scalp of mutant pigs. Okay, so that is important here. So now we have our pig results here. So we're looking at mutant pigs, and the results are shown in figure one. So let's go down and look at figure one here. Um, and when we look at figures, what are we looking for? We're, we're not necessarily going to understand everything we're looking at. 
because this is a research paper. It's going to probably be a little bit above our heads, but what can we pay attention to? We want to pay attention to trends. We want to pay attention, pay attention to um, axes and we want to pay attention to um, like if there's any, any kind of level of significance going on here. So we have OCA2 and B actin. We have I and scalp. We have wild type and then the mutation, wild type mutation. And then over here as well, I and scalp. And this is OCA2, B actin combined. So this one's separated and this one is combined. Um, I guess it would be relevant that it looks like they're both diminished here. And then over here, it looks like B actin's unaffected and OCA2 is decreased both in the I and the scalp. That might matter. Um, and then we read the description here, measuring, o measuring OCA2 expression in mutant mice by Western blotting. Okay, that's something we know. Um, just as a quick review, um, I'm sure most of you already know this acronym, but in terms of blotting techniques, um, there's a really common acronym called SNOWDROP. Um, and this acronym can help you quickly remember which blotting technique is used for what type of thing. So the S refers to um, the southern blot, the N is the northern blot, and the W is the western blot. And then the drop is D is DNA, RNA, and protein. So just by using this acronym of SNOWDROP, we can determine here that um, because we have a western blotting that we are dealing with protein. Um, this shouldn't be a surprise because just up ahead, we read that it did not alter at the transcript level, and they kind of hypothesized that it was protein. So we kind of knew it was going to be protein related, but um, so we're not surprised by this, but it is important to note because we do know what Western blotting is. So anything that you know about or that you know can be tested by the MCAT, it would probably just kind of perk your ears up, perk your eyes up a little bit when that shows up. Okay, next, the researchers sought to investigate whether the mutation induced growth or fertility in these um, mutant pigs, okay, or diseased pigs, sorry. So that's the next thing. So I would highlight the word next because we're now um, going into a new study or a new thing. Um, we're deciding if mutation induced growth or fertility. So now instead of looking at um, protein levels, we're looking at growth. So we're kind of looking a little bit further down the line than just the protein that's being produced. Researchers characterize the growth and reproductive traits of the pigs in comparison to wild type pigs by measuring litter size, number of weaned pigs, and mean litter birth weight. The results of these experiments are shown in figure two. Okay, so this is kind of just describing what they did. Um, that makes sense. Of course, it's going to be the wild type versus the um, ones with the mutation. Okay, then we look at figure two and we examine the results here. So we're going to have total litter size here, number weaned, and mean litter birth weight here. On So we're going to kind of just briefly look wild type versus mutation, wild type versus mutation, wild type versus mutation. I'm looking at the axes, looking for trends, I'm looking for significance, um, and I'm reading the description. So I'm aware that they're all here. I don't see any obvious trends as of now. Um, but we might come back later in the questions. It's just good to spend a couple seconds just to kind of get a feel for what's there so you can you can refer back if they ask anything about it. Okay, so let's get into the questions here. Number one, the change in properties of amino acids in the causative mutation for OCA2 can be best described as changing A. Okay, so we remember what the causative mutation was, we, I also remember highlighting a couple amino acids. So they're looking for the change in properties of the amino acids. So let's go back to where we remember highlighting some amino acids here. That was in this second paragraph here. Okay, so the serine transits into leucine and we have likely the causative mutation. Okay, so that's what it was asking us about. So serine to leucine. So that is what they're asking about. They're asking about the property of serine um, changing to the property of leucine. So um, for the MCAT, most of you probably already know this, but um, 
Amino acids are extremely high yield. You should know all of your amino acids, all of their properties, the one letter and three letter acronyms, and just kind of basically know them inside and out. Um, be able to recognize them if they show up in terms of their structures as well. Um, so in this case, they're asking about their properties. So what do we know about these two amino acids? We can probably answer this question without even looking at the answer choices, right? So we have serine and based off the fact that we know our amino acids well, we know that it's polar and uncharged. Uncharged, okay, and then we know that leucine is what? Leucine is hydrophobic. So we'll put that there underneath leucine. So our transition or our change in properties is going from polar uncharged to hydrophobic. So we'll see if any of the answers line up with that. Um, so we got charged amino acid to a hydrophobic. Okay, so it's got the leucine right, but we don't we don't have a charged serine. It's not charged. Now we have B, polar uncharged amino acids to a hydrophobic amino acid. That one's sticking out immediately as being very promising. Before we answer it, let's check to make sure the other two are also not right. Hydrophobic amino acid to a polar uncharged, no. Aromatic amino acids to charge, no. Okay, so that one's B. We can figure that one pretty easily. That's just a, um, were we paying attention to, to seeing what that causative mutation was? Could we pick that out quickly? With our highlights, we were able to do that. And then do we know our amino acids? Okay, pretty easy one. How about number two? Based on figure one, which of the following conclusions is most likely to be correct? Okay, so before we look at these answer choices so they don't lead us in a direction that we might not go, let's go over to figure one and see if we can draw any conclusions. So figure one, it looks like there's a couple of conclusions that we can draw. The first one would be that looking at that second graph there, um, I would probably say, yeah, so first conclusion would be we have um, our OCA2 and B-actin, or beta-actin. That is decreasing our eye and scalp. So decreasing eye and scalp. Okay, so that's our first thing from that second one. And then our... Our like first one here using our blotting techniques there it looks like B actin is not the cause but OCA2 is so OCA is causing a decrease in eye and a decrease in scalp so OCA2 and it's causing or at least we see a conclusion that it is decreasing we don't actually see that it's causing we can't prove that but we can see a decrease in the eye and scalp from the, that second one as well. So when they're combined and OCA2 alone decrease eye and scalp, those are kind of the two conclusions that we can draw there from figure one. Let's see if that lines up with any of our answer choices. Okay, so A, the S743L mutation decreases transcription. Okay, we know that's not true. I don't know if you remember earlier from when we were talking um, and also because of what we're doing here, Western blotting, we're measuring protein, we're not measuring transcription. But we can also remember from one of our highlights, the mutation did not alter at the description, transcription level. And we highlighted that so it's easy to pick out. Okay, so anything mentioning transcription, we can probably throw out pretty quickly. So we don't have a de decrease in transcription because it doesn't impact it. And then wild type mice can tear higher levels of transcripts. That would also be transcription level. We know that that can be thrown out immediately. Okay, and then we have S7. The mutation has lower levels of protein. Okay, that's possible. And then wild type mice translationally upregulate OCA2 protein. That's also possible. But is that what they talked about in the passage? No, it's not. So that's how we can kind of choose between c and d these are both possible answers like we have a decrease in oca2 protein in both the scalp and eye um which could come from the wild type mice translationally upregulating. that's possible it's not impossible for that but that's outside of what the passage is telling us s the the passage is telling us that they're studying whether or not this is lowering it 
and it did. So much more likely that the answer would be C versus D. Um, yeah, so we can we can go with that for that one based on our understanding of the passage. Number three, researchers find a second mutant that produces a UAG codon in the DNA. Which of the following best characterizes the nature of the mutation? Okay, so this is bringing up a couple things um, that we should know for the MCAT. The first thing is UAG codon. Um, instantly, we should recognize that as a stop codon. Um, and this is one of those things that should be in, included in your content review is what are your stop codons? And there's three of them that we should know. UAG, UG, oh, let me go down, UGA, and UAA. So we have our three stop codons. Anytime we see those show up in a question or anywhere, we should recognize right away that's a stop codon. Um, and what could be causing that that's what we're trying to figure out which of the following best characterizes the nature of the mutation that produces this codon okay so now we have four choices here the first of which is a nonsense mutation um, we know that a nonsense mutation produces a stop codon so we could stop right there because we recognize this is a stop codon we know that's correct for the um for the sake of practice, we're going to go through the rest of these, but in the actual test day, we could recognize that very quickly. That's irrefutable. Um, we wouldn't necessarily have to go through them unless we had a bunch of extra time. Um, so B, a point mutation. So what is a point mutation? That's a single, um, a single uh, nucleotide being changed. So if you're changing a single nucleotide, that means that only one of these letters would have changed from the previous um, three letter combination, but we don't know the three letter previous combination that was not mentioned anywhere in the passage or anything like that. So we can't know if this is a point mutation or not. So right away we can rule that one out. Okay, then we have our frame shift um, mutation. That would be like if the um, translation, so in like informing the amino acids, um, it's just shifted over, so the mutation of where the reading is has moved over. We don't know anything about about that. We don't know. We don't have any other information about whether or not this could be a frame shift. So we're going to count that out. And then a miss sense. Again, that one is is also we can rule that one out pretty quickly. A miss sense is that it's um, a miss sense mutation is one that a they take a three level nucleotide and they. They switch it around. We don't know what the initial one is. We can't know that that is a missense. Count that one out. Okay, so that one is pretty easy. Nonsense. Okay, number four. A researcher concludes that the mutated mice produce heavier offspring than wild type mice. Is this conclusion reasonable? Um, so let's go over and look at when we're looking at mean litter birth weight. Okay, where do we know about that? We know here we have conclusions about mean litter birth weight. So we are going to look in this area here. So we're looking for mean litter birth weight here. And here's our graph that's describing that. Um, so wild type versus mutation here. Um, by looking at the bars and looking at the clusters here, it doesn't look like they're very different. Um, another thing that we should be looking for in graphs to determine whether or not we have any kind of significant thing going on would be some form of asterisk or some form of like like look these are probably error bars we can assume they're error bars um, if those are not overlapping but our error bars are very clearly overlapping here by a, by a long bit so we don't see any asterisk we don't see um, any like clear difference in which the error bars are not overlapping so that's going to be pretty easy there um, it looks like there's nothing going on. There's going to be no difference in birth weight between the mutant and the wild type. So that's a type of answer that we're going to be looking for here. So a researcher concludes that they're heavier. So they're concluding that there is a difference. They're concluding heavier offspring. And we saw from the graph that there isn't a difference. So this conclusion is not reasonable. So right away, we're looking for any of these saying not reasonable. So A and B both say that it is reasonable. So we're going to count both of those out just because they say yes. The third one says no, the difference 
and mean offspring weight between wildlife or between wild type and the mice is not significant. I know we were studying pigs over here and not mice, but most likely we would see the same result in mice. So that one is consistent with the passage. And then D, the, the data in figure two contains too many outliers to make a conclusion. Okay, there are no outliers. I like that's usually pretty easy to pick out. Let's go over and look really quickly here. But yeah, as we look here, there's no outliers. They would be signified in some way as an outlier. We just we do see a couple outside, but they're all kind of generally within a clump here. Both the mutated and the wild type are kind of clumping together. We don't see we don't see outliers. So we can rule out D as well. So C is the only one that's consistent. So we're going to answer C there. Um, so yeah, that is how I would analyze a passage. Um, I think we did pretty well on that one. If you've enjoyed this video, feel free to give us a like on this video and subscribe to our channel so you don't miss any of our future MCAT content that we put out. Um, you could also go out and check out our MCAT 528 series for additional tips and tricks, as well as more strategies. And you can click the link in the description of this video to get additional practice questions sent to your inbox every single day so you don't miss out on any additional practice that you can get prior to your test. Happy studying!